So thanks everybody for being on the call. Dave, thank you for being on the call, making the time. Um, recently, we had a Midwest wide campus devotional and uh, Dave was able to offer some very, I think, helpful feedback uh, to me uh, as it was you know, kind of my role to head that up and uh, pick songs and gather the team together. And uh, Dave just was able to offer some really good feedback. And so we were emailing back and forth and just thought, hey, it might be a good idea to offer some training uh, and for Dave to offer a lesson uh, specifically to campus worship leaders. And so that's some of you. And so thank you for joining in. Uh, for those of you that don't know Dave, uh, Dave's uh, a longtime evangelist, longtime worship leader. He's uh, led worship teams all over the place, certainly in, in all the churches he's been part of. And he speaks on this topic at conferences, uh, for retreats, special workshops. And he, he just, he really knows what he's talking about, written a couple of books. And uh, so we're, we're blessed to be able to learn from him. Uh, he's also a personal friend. He uh, officiated Michelle and my wedding. And uh, we were on the same worship team together for um, many years in the Central Ministry Center of Chicago, which is now the Midpoint Ministry Center as they combined with the West. Um, but yeah, we just look up to him a lot. Uh, it was all through my, the latter half of my high school and into my whole college experience was with Dave at the helm leading worship and me learning from him. And so I respect him a ton and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what he has for us. As I understand it, he's got some Q&A time planned as well. And so I'd say during the lesson, uh, we'll just, you know, uh, we're all ears listening to Dave and then uh, he'll open it up for Q&A near the end. Uh, I thought though it'd be appropriate for us to go to the Lord in prayer to kick things off. And uh, Peter uh, Coupler, would you be willing to pray for us as we, we start our time here? Sure. Awesome. Father in heaven, thank you for this time to just be with you, be with uh, my brothers and sisters. Thank you for um, just putting on Josh's heart to put this together. Thank you, Father, for Dave and just his passion for worshiping you and um, just helping others um, just further connect and and uh, just bow down to you, Father. And um, thank you for how holy you are, God. You deserve all the praise and all the worship. And I pray that um, in this time you can just give us wisdom that we can further, um, yeah, just honor and proclaim your name. And we love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, first off, I'm uh, super grateful for the work that all of you have done in worship. And it's, uh, to me, uh, you know, coming in the, in the, in this sunset of my ministry career, uh, I mean, I plan on being involved in worship until I topple over. Um, but uh, being where I am, it's so encouraging to see uh, just your zeal and passion and desire to continue to take it higher and to continue to do uh, things in worship that are fresh and new and yet tied into the ancient. Um, it's just great. And I so, so appreciate all of the talents and the gifts that you bring to the table. Um, I mean, this, the, some of the impressive stuff that's been done technically with, uh, with some of the work that's come out of Champaign uh, the campus devotionals, uh, the, the, this recent night of lamentation that you had, I thought was just amazing. Um, I, and I know Tanner has been involved in a lot of that. Josh has been involved in that. Many of you have been involved in that, uh, both as artists and as technical geniuses. I love the, just the collaboration and the skill that you all bring to the table. So, so let me start off by just saying thank you. And uh, I'm confident that uh, once my generation is out of the picture, you guys will take it to a completely different level and uh, continue to go higher and higher. Um, just a little bit about me. I, I became a disciple about 45 years ago um, in Gainesville, Florida, at the Crossroads Church of Christ. I was raised as a, as a pagan, pretty much. Uh, got super fired up about the gospel when I was a freshman at the University of Florida. And... Um, Got baptized in 1976, um, and a number of years later, I, uh, I began studying extensively on the subject of worship. It, it became something that actually became my kind of my favorite thing to study. And so, I'll I'll say unashamedly, I'm a 
I'm a nut about worship. I'm really opinionated about it. And you, know, you don't have to share my opinions, but I'm very, I have a lot more enthusiasm than I have talent. And so, uh, but I am ex so excited about worship and about studying worship and understanding worship. And it has changed my life so much and, uh, and gotten me uh, into a, a better place spiritually. Um, about 2004, I started really focusing on this topic and uh, reading lots of good books, uh, digging into the meaning of Hebrew words in the book of Psalms, uh, and digging into the worship experience of our churches. And, and in that day, when, when we started, you know, it hasn't been that long ago, we were singing only Western European hymns from 300 years ago, 500 years ago, in some cases, a thousand years ago. And uh, it, it was not, it's not that I don't like those songs. I think they're the heritage that we come from is wonderful. But, you know, again, it, it, it was stuff that wasn't really resonating with me. It wasn't really helping me draw near to God uh, to the same degree. And so I, I began to really look into the worship experience of the churches. At that same time, I began to hear, you know, pay more attention to what was going on in the contemporary Christian world with Hillsong and Chris Tomlin and Michael W. Smith and uh, a lot of the gospel artists, Hezekiah Walker is a, a favorite of mine, Fred Hammond. Um, and so I just began to try to open myself up to a lot of different influences in our worship and in, in the ways that we can approach God. And uh, I ended up uh, writing a book uh, called Life Changing Worship. Uh, I started a web page uh, called uh, originally lifechangingworship.org. Um, uh, we, we produced a number of short instructional videos. We invited worship leaders from around the world to drop in and to drop in articles. Uh, Josh has written a, a great series of articles on spoken word, um, uh, spoken, spoken scripture. And uh, so, you know, when I got that, when Josh asked me to, to pop in and, and share some thoughts with you, I, I was really excited to do that because there's really nothing I like talking about more. I've, I've been able to teach uh, worship material on uh, four or five continents now, uh, lots of different places around the U.S., South and Central America. Uh, I've taught it in India. I've taught it in Africa. And so I'm, again, I'm a, I'm a real nut about it, and, and I just love talking about it. I love teaching it, and I love that we can have back and forth as I hear your ideas and your vision for what you hope uh, to do through your worship ministry. Um, in, in our time today, I'd like to, to start off by answering three questions uh, pertaining to our worship. Uh, number one, why do we worship? Uh, number two, how does worship impact us? And number three, how does worship impact evangelism? And so uh, let, let's just do it. Uh, let, let's start with question number one, why do we worship? Uh, simply put, we worship because God is entirely worthy of our praise, of our adoration, of, of words, of, of expressions of gratitude and awe and admiration and passionate love. Um, in, the, in the presence of, of the Almighty, the natural way that people should respond is a response of awe and adoration and admiration. We look to the rich heritage of, of thousands of years of worshipers. It's, it's cool that we don't have to come up with this stuff ourselves because our, the heritage that we come from that comes way back, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, more later, but if you, if you just start reading through your Bible and, and seeing the way God-loving people um, responded to God, uh, if you have a, a Bible or your Bible device handy, or just jot down the verse and look at it later. Over in Isaiah chapter six, we uh, when, when I the first time I read all the way through the Bible, this this verse really stunned me. Um, and I'll read the first five verses of Isaiah six. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, 
and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You know, Isaiah saw this vision of the Lord, and, and it doesn't really tell us exactly what he saw. He, he might have only seen the train of his rope. Uh, but, you know, the temple was one of the, the great wonders, man-made wonders of the, of the ancient world. And so you had this huge temple, and the train of God's robe, the end of his robe, completely filled the temple to the top and to overflowing. And so he looked up beyond the temple, and he looked up toward the, the heavens, and he saw these winged seraphs, these incredible winged angelic beings uh, singing, holy, holy, holy. And, and the Bible says, when he saw it, he said, I am I am undone. I am unraveled. And the, the Hebrew word there is a really interesting word. It's a, I don't know if you've ever uh, taken apart an old golf ball, but you know, the way they used to make golf balls is they had this little core and then they would wrap rubber bands, short stretches of rubber band around it. So when I was a kid, we used to carve those things and take an X-Acto knife. We'd open up the, the golf ball. And once you got out of the, uh, the, the gluey part, the ball kind of developed a life of its own. These little bands of rubber would, would jump off and the, the ball would jump around and, and then ultimately you would end up with just a big pile of short rubber bands. That's that word, that Hebrew word undone. It means we are unraveled and placed in component parts. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very dynamic word and it's a very humble word that, that people feel when they get into the presence of God. And I'm not, I'm not sure we're really going to get that until we, um, we actually get a chance to be with the Lord and see him in all of his greatness. But you look at the history of the Old Testament, anybody who had any kind of vision of God, they had this same kind of response. Uh, Ezekiel, when he saw visions of the Lord, he, he, it produced in him an awe and amazement and he sat on the banks of the Kibar River, sitting there dumbly for seven days, completely overwhelmed. The Lord is that powerful. Uh, throughout history, the, the, any time you see any facet of the greatness of the Almighty, the response is one of worship. And when we, when we work this, when worship is a part of our daily lives and and it then explodes out into what we do on a on a sunday or at a devotional or at a midweek service we we carry this uh reservoir of worship within us and and just like a, a volcano when it gets ready to bubble out we just explode in these expressions of praise and awe and admiration to god because we're filled with a love and a passion for the Lord and a, a deep gratitude toward what God has done in our lives. Now, when, let, let's define terms really quick here. When we talk about worship in this, in this meeting here, we're really talking about what we put together and do to lead the church to the presence of God. That's, that's this topic. But in a larger sense, worship is really everything we do. It's, it's the reason that as a student, you need to work hard in all your classes, that's part of your worship to God. An employee, if you're, if you're, whatever you're doing, if you're a dishwasher, man, you need to, you need to wash those dishes clean because that's part of your worship to God. If you're an engineer, man, you need to give your attention to, to making your business successful because that's part of your worship to God. And it all, all that comes together. And we, we have this passion burning in our hearts that when we come to a collection of the saints, a group of God's people, then it can then explode forth in what we give of ourselves to the group that we're leading. So let, let's talk for a minute about the second part of this. How does worship impact us? And I'm, I'm reading here from Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 7. It says there, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So let me, let me ask you a question, uh, and, and you can be very specific with the answer. 
when did God make you alive with Christ? What was the moment in time when God made you alive with Christ? What's the, what's the question I'm asking, right? It's, it's when were you saved? So when, when did that happen? Uh, Daniela, when, when were you saved? Tell me when that happened. Um, October 4th, 2013. Okay. Oh, there's Elliot. Hey, Elliot, how you doing? I didn't see you there. Uh, it's good to see you, man. I knew Elliot from Chicago. So, Elliot, when were you made alive with Christ? Uh, like the date or like... Yeah, you remember the date? Uh, like... Se September 8th, I think, like 2016. Okay. okay. I and, uh, Michelle, Michelle, I was there when you made Jesus Lord. What was the, what was the date? Remind me of the date of that. Yeah, it's, it's been 11 years, June 18th, uh, 09. 09. Okay. Uh, Alana, how about you? November 7th, 2018. Okay. Now let me ask you another question right alongside with that. When did God raise you up and seat you with him in the heavenly realms? When did, when did that happen? Anybody want to take a whack at that one? I'll give you a hint. It was the exact same time as the answer to the first question. Um, God raised us up and he seated us with him. In the, in the Greek language, this is in the aorist active tense. Uh, I'm sorry, the indicative aorist tense. And what that means is that that is a past action fully completed that occurred at a moment in time. So that means that whether you're sitting in Madison, Wisconsin, or Champaign, Illinois, or Fishers, Indiana, or wherever it might be for you, um, that right now at this very moment, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. If you've been baptized into Christ, that's where you are. It's a past action. It's done. You're there. Now, raise your hand if you always feel like you're seated with God in the heavenly realms. As you go about living your life, oh, yeah, I'm always right there in that. You know, we, we, don't, we don't always feel that way, do we? we? You know, the world beats us up, and it throws stuff in our path, and it, it messes with us. And so we don't always feel connected to God like that. And so we might leave an inspiring worship service or a particularly invigorating quiet time or a, a great conversation with one of our good friends filled with the knowledge of this reality that, hey, man, I'm with the Lord. I'm walking with the Lord. I feel the sense of God. But life intrudes, doesn't it? It quickly intrudes, and it this conscious knowledge that we're with the Lord leaves us for a moment. So how do we make the reality of our biblical experience that we are seated with God in the heavenly realms, how do we make that a reality in our daily living experience? Well, the answer to that question is worship. Worship is what awakens us to our legitimate reality, to our genuine reality. Look with me in Psalm 89, uh, verses 15 through 17. Uh, one of my very favorite passages on this idea. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long, they exult in your righteousness, for you are their glory and strength. Now, what we learn from this verse is that worship makes us happy. The word blessed is, you know, the word that we, that we see uh, in the Greek uh, translation, uh, in the Beatitudes, in the Greek language, and here it's in the Hebrew language in, in uh, Psalm 89. Uh, but it's the it, it's you can define it as is happy with a happiness that the world cannot understand and that really is oftentimes illogical right the, the world beats us up the world does a lot of things to make us unhappy uh, we're in a very such a hard time now in our cities with uh, all of the, uh, the the things we're learning about racism and, and the depth of to which our country is sort of mired in that reality 
Um, and so, the, you know, these are, these are things that I'm, I'm sure, especially for those of you who are from African-American background, th those are things that are just difficult and, and there's hopelessness and there's unhappiness and there's frustration with the slow pace of change and all of those things go on. But a disciple can enjoy blessedness, this illogical happiness. We can enjoy this when we learn to acclaim God. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim them. And that, and that Hebrew word there, acclaim, is a, is a word that describes the sounding of a trumpet, uh, the, uh, the blast of war, an alarm cry. It's, it's an energetic word. It's a loud word. It's a word that, that requires a lot of energy and a lot of zeal. Um, and that's, by the way, characteristic of so many of the Hebrew words. If you dig into them in the book of Psalms, so many of these words are high energy where they just demand that you flat burn some calories when you worship, that, that worship can be part of your aerobic exercise plan for the week because it demands a lot of us. Now, it is in the acclamation of God's greatness and love that we are sensitized to the presence of God. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, for they walk in the light of your presence. Now, theologically, we are never not in the light of his presence, right? We're always in his presence because God is omnipresent, right? By definition, if, if you understand the omniscience, omnipresence, etc., of God, there is never a time when we are not walking in his presence. The question is, do we always feel that way? Uh, do we, are we always alert to that and aware of that? And I think that the answer, of course, is not. Um, if, if it were, we, we'd probably never sin. You know, we, we would always be pretty happy no matter what happened. We wouldn't be anxious. We'd live life on a completely different plane, but that is not our reality. And so in order to, for us to get there ourselves, in, in order for us to help our members of our churches to get there, we have to learn and teach them to acclaim God. Uh, the, the next thing is that what worship does for the worshiper is worship helps us to banish the blues. Um, I'm a, I'm kind of an artsy fartsy guy and I'm, I'm, my temperament is melancholic. Uh, is, is there anybody else on this call? Or just give it, raise your hand if you tend to be melancholic or all of you just naturally joyful or, or some of you more melancholic. All right. There's melancholic a couple, three, mean? four, five, six. Uh, melancholic means uh, you wake up sometimes and you just got the blues and there's not really any good reason for it, but I'm just kind of feeling bluesy, right? Okay, so we, a lot of us, I think many artistic people um, have this as a part of their temperament. Now, I, I, I get a little bit extra of this because I come from a, a heritage of manic depression and, and uh, uh, bipolar disorder. and That's all back in the blood of my family. Um, but even if you're not predisposed, everybody gets the blues, right? Everybody gets, feels down a little bit. Uh, it's a part of the, the battle that we often fight in this life. Um, the sons of Korah, who wrote a number of the Psalms, were no strangers to this. If you look over in Psalm 42, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? So, a lot of the psalmists, uh, David was one of the first great blues musicians going back thousands of years. But a, a lot of the, the psalms are psalms that, that call us out of the difficult times that we face in life and call us to overcome those things. And so though the sons of Korah in, this, in the beginning of this ch uh, chapter are despondent, they come back with this. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So the psalmist sort of works himself out of this despondency and this melancholia he feels. He works himself out of this 
through the praise and adoration of God. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim him who walk in the light of your spirit. I mean, worship does so much for us. It, it, uh, a lifestyle of worship helps us through temptation. It satisfies our souls in a way that nothing else does. There's so many benefits to living a worshipful life and uh, things that really help us to get out of the, what the world, what Satan, what, what is being thrown at us day after day, depending on your own personal experience, all the things that come at you. Worship is one of those things that helps us. Now, the third question that I wanted to address is how does worship impact others? Uh, a lot of you know that um, in Indianapolis, we, over the last couple of years, engaged in an 18-month process of rebranding the uh, Indy, Indianapolis Church of Christ. We, we call ourselves Rise Church now. And it was a, it was a very arduous process. It, it, there were a lot of started the stops and starts, and we didn't really know how to do it, so we were kind of learning as we went. And uh, we were in one of our stuck times when we invited a, a marketing specialist who, at that time, uh, he was a member of our church who was a marketing guy for the NBC tele television network. And he shared with us that they, at NBC, they filter every decision they make about programming through what they call the Jennifer filter. And so the Jennifer filter, they identified their target audience, and she was a 37-year-old uh, woman. She had at least one child, um, and, you know, they, they sort of drew out this picture of what this person is, and they had reasons that they, they selected her. And so the Jennifer filter helped them to define exactly what stories they would run, what programs they would show, what series they would script, because they were aiming for this demographic. And so he said, you got to go back and you got to figure out who, who is Rise Church, or it wasn't at that time, it wasn't Rise Church, but who is your church trying to reach? And so we, we have, we developed a Michael and Jessica filter. Uh, Michael and Jessica are 20 to 30 years old. Uh, they're, they're black, they're white, they're Asian, uh, but they're, they're young, they're millennial. They, they are concerned about the environment. They're concerned about uh, race issues. They're concerned about making the world a better place. And so we've begun to, to script our church services and this gets into the selection of music, who we have up front, who is introducing things. We're trying to script these things to Michael and Jessica. Their key phrases are things like authenticity. Uh, they're concerned about authenticity. They're concerned about collaboration. They're concerned about um, conviction. And so all of the decisions we make, our, our decor, our social media presence, our coffee shop, all of these run through the filter of Michael and Jessica. Now, as we begin to bore down into the selection of worship styles and worship music, we have a lot of different competing voices. And I know you know this, if you're involved in all in, in planning music, everybody's got an opinion, right? But like a few of our older members in Indy, uh, they came back from the old, from the, the ancient of days, like me. Um, they are concerned with, you know, they would love it if we just did 400 year old European hymns every week. That would be fine with them. That's kind of what they grew up with, but it wouldn't be fine with me. Uh, and it wouldn't be fine with Michael and Jessica. That's, that's not what they're looking for. Um, our, of course, our African, uh, many of our African-American members love urban gospel. They love the, the Hezekiah Walkers and the Fred Hammonds and, and the, uh, the many great, great artists of, that, that bring about the, this incredibly passionate, keyboard-driven, choir-driven, great African-American music. We have one, two, two that we're doing tomorrow in our service, a song by Ron Canoli called Ancient of Days, which is... Uh, Josh and Michelle remember that one. That's one of one of our favorites. Um, uh, Going up yonder, which is a, a great old classic gospel hymn. We we do a lot of stuff by Hezekiah. We do a lot of stuff um, by a number of these more well known uh, African American artists. Um, and so then a lot of our younger millennial members they're more into uh, contemporary worship, elevation worship, Hillsong worship, 
um, Michael W. Smith, uh, you know, things that are more, uh, now I guess, I guess Michael W. Smith has been around long enough that he might not be considered contemporary anymore, but we, we, we listen to a lot of these newer groups that are coming out, uh, Carrie Job and some of the great stuff that they're producing that is very vertical. It's very connective. It's the uh, best way to describe it probably is a musical prayer. And so that that's become very popular uh, among younger people. So how do we balance all of this out? Well, in indie, this is how we do it. And, and by the way, I'm not trying to tell you what you should do. I'm just trying to explain to you our process and how we work through these things. Uh, since our primary filter is Michael and Jessica, we tend to land fairly strongly on the side of contemporary, vertical, and gospel. That's Those are sort of that's how I would define most of what we do here in Indianapolis. We sing, you know, we do from time to time, we do musical arrangements of some of the older hymns, or we might tie in an older hymn, like say we do the song, Holy, 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 but we tie it in with one of the more modern songs. And of course, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, or, or some notable among the younger contemporary artists actually pull in some of the ancient songs and, and they, they rewrite uh, choruses to them and things like that. So they can sort of combine the old with the new. And we, we enjoy doing some of that. So I, I, my recommendation is I think in our, whatever group we're leading, we've got to figure out who are we trying to reach? Who are we trying to impact? My generation, uh, I'm in my sixties now, and, and my generation has to realize that, we are not the we are not the future of the church we you are the future of the church and you've got to figure out what songs are going to help people who are 18 19 20 25 30 years old what songs are going to help these people connect most intimately with god how are we going to help them learn to acclaim the lord in ways that are relevant contemporary, connective. Uh, when I talk about vertical music, I'm talking about prayer music work that in the very nature of the music helps us to feel a connection to God. How are we gonna, gonna do that? And so I think that's what you rest with as you, as you think about uh, the, the songs that, that we do from week to week on a Sunday, a devotional, a midweek, is who am I trying to impact and, and how can I best do that as a worship leader? And, and uh, this is a whole different lesson. Um, a worship leader is someone who takes the church by the hand and walks them into the presence of God. That's, that's your job. The clearest definition I've come up with of the job of any worship leader. And by the way, that's the person that's, that's playing the guitar and singing the song. That's the person that's singing the alto line. That's the person because we, you know, we we lead people through our, through this, through our countenance, right? Uh, I I think the the stats are sixty five seventy percent of the impact you have on people is not the glory of your angelic voice, it is what people see when they look at your face as you lead worship. If you're if you're doing, holy, holy, holy. God Almighty, you know, if you're doing that, you're not going to lead anybody anywhere except maybe to a nice nap for the next hour at church. Uh, we we have to we have to lead with joy and with expressiveness and with zeal. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim Him. There's a lot of there's a lot of shouting in the Bible. There's a lot of shouting in the Book of Psalms. A lot of enthusiasm, and not to take away from the times of, of meditative worship and quiet worship and silent meditation and all of that, instrumental meditation, all that's very valuable. But in terms of when we're singing songs, man, we better be singing them intentionally, intelligently. We better know the lyrics we're saying from behind our microphone so that we can really move the church into the presence of God with everything that happens with our spirits. And that's my encouragement. Um, my final thought in, in term, before we get into any Q&A that we might have, uh, pertains to your ongoing education as worship leaders. 
Uh, hopefully, you will all be serving your churches for many decades in, in this way. If, if God has gifted you uh, vocally, musically, et cetera, like it, if Amy decided that she was going to hoard her gift and all she was going to do is sing it to her husband, that would be very, very selfish of her because, um, because God has given her this thing and, and God wants her to use this thing that she has to be a blessing to other people. And so in the same way, we've got to take, we've got to figure out what, what are, how do, do my gifts lend themselves to service in the church? And uh, it's only right that if your gift is musical or, or whatever your gift is, that you use that gift in the ways that it will be a blessing to your, your God, your church, your brothers and sisters, your community, uh, to, that it be a great blessing for that. So wh where do you go? Well, the, the book of Psalms needs to become your best friend. Uh, the book of Psalms is the, the first Psalm was written by Moses about 3,500 years ago. And the Psalms themselves span a period of time of about 3,000 years from the, the first Psalm that, that Moses wrote. Um, no, that's not right. It's, it's not 3,000 years. It's closer to 2,000 years. The, the last Psalm was written about 586 uh, BC. So from the first Psalm of Moses to 586, you've got this, this big span uh, collection of great worship um, psalms. It, uh, the psalms tell us why to worship. They tell us how to worship. They tell us, they describe styles of worship. They talk about the various kinds of energy levels in worship. The psalms tell us what to say. They tell us how to say it. It is the most vital tool in your personal arsenal of worship materials and rightly so because it's the it's the god breathed worship manual of the old testament and the new testament we're called to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs so we need to we need to know that book we need to understand that book we need to learn what the words mean uh, we need to figure out okay since this is what this word means then this is how i can i can put it out there uh, by the way, a lot of this, um, the material about the, the meanings of Hebrew words is found on the lifechangingworship.org webpage. There's short three to four minute videos that describe a word and sort of give an example. And it, that would be good for you to start uh, as it leads you to, to do your own study and to dig into some of these things yourselves. And by the way, there's a lot of really great books on worship. And if you're a worship leader and you haven't read what other people have to say about worship, man, uh, you've missed a lot. There's, there's a lot of instruction you can get from great worship leaders that have gone before us um, that could, could really be a blessing to your life. So those are just a, a few thoughts that I have. Obviously, there's so much more to say, but uh, I want to be sensitive to your schedule and uh, that sort of thing. So that's all I got. Thank you so much, Dave. Applause all around. Give the little uh, clapping emoji if you'd like. <laughs> uh, Dave, appreciate it. I, I was uh, fur fur furiously, that's the word, taking down some notes. And uh, I, I wrote down at least two questions, and I'm sure that there's some folks that maybe have some questions as well. Uh, are we okay to go into a little bit of a Q&A section? Cool. Uh, so I'm sure this is a common uh, struggle that a lot of folks go through. I'll start off with the first question, but uh, anybody else... Uh, if you've got one, feel free to throw it in the chat and, and we can kind of get a queue of questions going. Uh, but for the first one, I'm sure that this is a, a common struggle that a lot of folks are going through. You know, you've been tasked with, okay, I've got to sing some songs at this church event uh, and I'm going to plan it and, uh, and, and I need to figure out what, what's my selection? What songs are we going to sing? And maybe it's uh, you making the decision or maybe it's a team of people making the decision. Uh, but I, my question is, how do you prioritize the criteria by which you make those selections? Because there's a lot of factors and considerations uh, that come into my mind. And so I think about my audience, uh, kind of like you were saying, the, the Jessica uh, filter or the you know, Michael and Jessica filter. I, I, I bring that into account. I try to think about who's the... Yeah, who's the audience? What are they like? What's the ages? You know, the songs I pick for a teen devotional might be different than a Sunday service, right? Because of the audience. Uh, but then I also consider things like 
the uh, the content of the sermon. Like if I know what it's going to be about, then I try to think about making connections there. But I, I just, there's almost too many. And then you start thinking about style of music. Well, I want to make sure that I get one gospel song, and one contemporary song, and maybe one hymn for the folks that really love that. And you try to get a mix. But yeah, I guess my question is, when you're sitting down to think about, let me plan the service, uh, how do you prioritize those criteria by which you make those selections? Um, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, I, I come to the table with one, one goal in, in our worship times, is that I want to take people from however the world has beat them up over the course of the week, and I want to give them an experience of the presence of God. That's, that's my desire. And so I don't, I don't pay much attention. I mean, I, I always know what's going to be preached on a given week. Uh, of course, a lot of weeks I'm doing the preaching, so hopefully I know. Um, but then even when I'm not the, the preacher of the day, you know, we, we schedule out our sermons and we know what we're going to be preaching from month to month in the different series we use it. So I don't really think much about staying on topic and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the way I do it. Um, but so my, my goal is I, I want to take people. Okay. People are walking in. They've, they've had the trash beat out of them all week in their lives. Satan has, has done a number on them. And so how can I get them out of their funk and lead them to a point where they can intelligently take communion where they can eagerly listen to the word of God, uh, where they can meditate without the, the cares and concerns of, of the things they've been going through in their job or in the, the culture, the society, some of these crazy things that are happening in our world today. Um, so how can I do that? So, so my answer to that is uh, stylistically, uh, you know, I always want to start off with something that is energetic and lively and demands the expenditure of energy. And so usually the first one or two songs are high energy. They demand that people get up on their feet and, and sing with, with passion and power. And then, and then I want to begin to transition into, into songs that will help people make a visceral connection to the supernatural. I mean, in my perfect world, anybody who comes to our church they leave their knowing, man, I didn't, I didn't just go to church today. Man, I went and I met with the Lord Almighty today. And man, I felt him in the singing and I experienced him in the prayers and I communed with him with my brothers and sisters and I heard his word and I, I was right there in the presence of the Almighty. Uh, living in the heavenly realms is, is our... Is our um, is our current reality, but it's, it's not, it's not our everyday experience. It's, it, we, we have to get ourselves there. We have to fight deliberately to get to that plane. And so actually I have all our, our playlist for all the songs we typically do in our rotations. I have them, I have them uh, grouped by, um, uh, let me go and I'm going to actually look them up here and see it. I, I have them grouped by, by topic. Uh, or by, I guess a better way to say that is by style. So I've got this Rise Worship playlist. And so I have them categorized in intro songs, what I call intro songs. These are songs I'll kick off the worship with. Momentum songs that, that take that energy from the first song and carry it on. And then more meditative songs. And then I have a category for gospel songs because we've just really started to, to uh, increase our playlist on gospel songs. Um, original songs, you know, so I, and, and those will end up going into these different categories. And so typically when I'm planning worship, I, I sort of go with a, you know, two from column A, one from column B, two from column C sort of strategy. Uh, and then I'll, I'll weave those things together with, with readings and prayers and uh, sharing and maybe throw in a video or, or uh, maybe use some, some worship pads to kind of go from one song to the other. Because I want the, the worship to have a nice... Uh, uninterrupted flow from one element of the service all the way through to the last element of the service without this sort of staccato, we're going to start and we're going to go and then we're going to stop and we're going to blow something in the pitch pipe and then we're going to go again. It's that's to me, that's very jarring. And that's, that's not what I want our team to do. So 
that's that's sort of how I go about it. So, thanks. That, I, I think that's helpful, and uh, I've seen it and seen you in action doing that. And I remember the columns and picking uh, songs like that. Uh, I think that's that's helpful. Um, it looks like Amy has uh, typed in a couple questions there. Amy, do you want to ask those, or maybe the first one? Sure. Yeah. My first question was just. Sorry, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, was just that, you know, with the coronavirus, I feel like I've just been wondering if our outlook should change because it seems that it's more, we used to always say like, you know, worship isn't a performance, but now it feels a lot more like a performance. Um, and even we're starting to have people come back to our services, but like no one can sing except for me. And so I'm just wondering if you've thought about how, like as worship leaders, how we should approach this now differently well i think uh, that's, that's a great question I, th I think that we have an opportunity uh and we've had this this opportunity for a while now to expose our churches to different kinds uh, of worship music and different songs um styles and songs like like when we've um, for instance we used uh the song that daniella did at the recent campus devotional we used that in our service last sunday and, uh, you know, is, is a, just a beautiful, very moving song, a very meditative song. And so I don't, I don't get the impression that people are sitting in their living rooms or on their front porches live streaming and singing these songs. Now, we do. I mean, when Kathy and I live stream, if we, if we pre-recorded our service, you know, we'll, we'll participate on our front porch uh, and sing the songs. But I don't know if a lot of people do that. So I do think that like I'm, we're trying to introduce new songs now during a time where people are listening because we believe that of course, you know, eventually, even if it's not till next February, we're all going to be back together again. And so these people are going to be singing these songs, but I think we should be doing the very best we can and exercising the full range of our skill as we, as we do these live streams. So yes, it feels like a performance, but it's, it's not a performance. You're still leading your group in worship. They're having to decide how they express that worship, whether through listening or through participating. But then when you get together, see, now they, now they know all these songs. They've heard these songs. And, and when you're singing them, for example, they've heard them really well. They've heard them the way they should be done. So they know what they're supposed to be singing and they can really give themselves to them. So that's how I would, um, I, I don't think the outlook has changed at all. I think that it depends on the reality of the person who's actually sitting and worshiping, how they're going to respond to it. Um, can I go on to your second question? Okay. Uh, the second question is, should we still strive to perform gospel music, even if we don't have many black members in our worship team, or we don't have the voices necessary? This is a tricky thing because, of course, so much of the best, in my opinion, the best gospel, the most moving gospel music is very choir driven. You, you got to have half dozen, eight, 10 minimum good voices to really pull off what uh, some of these uh, groups have been able to do and what, what just moves these uh, urban congregations so powerfully. Um, I think I, I would recommend that every worship team try to learn to the ability of your group to pull it off, would try to learn that because even if you if you don't have a lot of black members on your worship team, our cities all have a, a great population of African Americans. And if we want to really speak to our city and we want to pull in black, white, Asian, Latino, et cetera, if we want to really have the cross cultural impact that is so unique in our world today, we have to be speaking that language as a part of the, of the whole thing that we do. So, I can send you, I mean, there's a, there's a good number of songs. I mean, I can give you a couple. There's a, a song, uh, this is a Fred Hammond song, I Call You Faithful. Uh, the, the Hawkins family sang Going Up Yonder. That's, anybody can sing that song. I mean, it's better if it's done by a powerful African-American voice, but, but it can be done. Uh, you Are Good uh, by Israel Houghton. Uh, when I Think About the Lord by Christ for the Nations. Israel, Jesus at the Center of It All. Hezekiah, Every Praise, Better, uh, Charles Jenkins, Awesome. I mean, there's so many, and I'll, I'll send this list out, by the way, to, to uh, just share, somebody had asked me to share that, that list. Um, and really so I'll, I'll send that out to you. 
um, in terms of what, what we're doing now. But my opinion is that if we hope to reach all nations, we have to be willing to embrace the music of all nations as a, as a part of who we are as a collective family that's interracial and intergenerational. So, so here's my beautiful wife, Kathy. That's awesome. Uh, no, 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 you don't know everybody. There she Hi, is. Kathy. Kathy. All right, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. And, I know mine. You know Elliot from Chicago. Yes. And I and of course Daniela. Oh yes. And who else? Amy Kinzer. Yeah, I think yes, you know. I know okay. All right. <laughs> Very good. So uh, everybody, I just dropped a, a Google form into the chat. Uh, that's a way for us to quickly collect email addresses. And then these resources that Dave is talking about, he can send to me and I can make sure that, that gets out to everybody. Uh, but there's a place that you can drop in your email and then also a couple of questions that you can give uh, Dave feedback and maybe say thanks, that sort of thing in the form. So um, I did have uh, another question and then maybe we can take one or two more uh, and then close this thing up. Um, so I really love the second point as you're talking about Psalm 89 and learning to acclaim God and how that can lead to um, alleviating some of the downcast feelings and just the sadness uh, that is so prevalent in our world and in our life. And when we uh, encounter those things, it can just be so palpable that we feel deeply uh, sad. And when we worship and we learn to worship, that that can be alleviated and we can recenter ourselves and think about the Lord. Um, my question is though, what do you do when somebody uh, has an opinion about worship that it's just, we're just singing songs. Well, that's not doing anything. We're just singing. Um, and if somebody maybe even has a, just a negative feeling towards singing and worship and taking man, five songs in the service, come on, let's get it over with. Let's get to the sermon. And, and if somebody is coming at it with that opinion or that kind of mindset, how do you maybe address that? In a, in a kind or helpful way to try to redirect somebody so that they can see the joy that can come and really the learning and the acclimation that you're talking about and is talked about in Psalm 89. I tend to rebuke them harshly for their ungodly attitudes. No, not really. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I think the, the, it's, it's, all a, it's all a question of conversation. It's, um, I would turn the question back and say, why don't you tell me, how do you accomplish the command to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16? How do you accomplish that uh, apart from musical worship? That's number one. I, I'd go back to the book of Psalms. I mean, and you can, you can, you can feed these psalms. I mean, Psalm 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 103, 139, 145 through 150. I mean, there's so many incredible songs that talk about shouting to God and singing our praises. And I would just say, you know, we're, we're here to make a joyful noise to the Lord. We're here to express the love that we feel in our hearts toward him to the, to the very best of your abilities. Now, the other thing I think we need to realize is that people connect in different ways. And I, I think we need to be respectful of all the ways they connect I think probably that person that you're referring to is is a, in the vast minority of people. I'd, I'd say maybe five out of a hundred people would feel that way. Um, and maybe they connect. Like I talked to one brother, I said, because he was having the same conversation with me. Yeah, this is a number of years ago. And I said, well, bro, tell me, how do you connect? When do you feel most connected to God? He said, it's when I reach it in my wallet and, and drop my check in the contribution basket. That's when I really feel like, man, I've, I've been in the presence of God today and I'm, I'm engaging back and forth with God. And I, I thought, man, I don't relate to that at all. That, that doesn't, I mean, I, I do that, you know, I do it. Of course, now I do it online, but, uh, you know, we're, we're scheduled to do it and we, we always give what we give. And, um, and, but that doesn't really move me that much, but that did move him. Uh, some people are really moved through deep exegetical study of God's word. And that's, that's their highlight 
of worship, others in the communion, others in the fellowship. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that we worship and we feel that sense of connection. So I think we need to be respectful of that with other people and say, well, well I appreciate your, your, your thoughts. I just think you have to, you have to step back and have a, a, a larger perspective that my estimate is about 70 to 75% of people are deeply moved by musical worship. And that's not surprising because music is a part of every celebration of life. It's, it's what we do at our weddings and it's what we do when the, uh, the, when we get together to have a party, you know, in the world, you go to a, you go to a nightclub and what do you do? Do you go to a nightclub to meditate together? No, you, you go to listen to music and to dance and to, and to do that sort of thing. And so it, music is just a, it's a part of the fabric of life. And, uh, you know, he may be in the minority of, and, and I think I was probably being generous when I said five out of a hundred, two or three out of a hundred who feel that way. So I would, I would try to help him to have a, a larger perspective of the church as a whole. And as an add on as a, so, uh, when someone, let, let's, let's say that, yeah, they, they like music, they like musical worship. They want to do that, but they don't appreciate the music that we're playing. They always want something different or they feel like, yeah, my needs aren't getting met uh, because we never sing the songs that I like. And so let's say if somebody's in that group where they uh, are maybe just super critical of what our worship teams are able to put forward. Um, and I, I'm asking a lot of these questions generally. I'm not thinking of anybody in, you know, specifically, but I think these are some challenges that we come across. And so the question is, then, how do we address that? How do you, address, yeah, yeah. How do you help try to encourage somebody who's not being encouraged by what we're currently doing with our worship team or what we're able to accomplish? I wish we would just sing this type of music, and we don't. And, uh, right. and, and they're maybe having a, just a critical spirit about that. Well, and again, I, I think there's probably the same. My first thought, without thinking about it a lot. My first thought is that it would be the same as the answer to the first question is that they need to understand that what works for them, their first language of worship is not my first language of worship. And it's not Elliot's first language of worship. And it's not Will's first language of worship. And it's not necessarily Daniela's first language of worship. You know, everybody has their, their language and their preferences. And uh, you know, when we, you know, I think about the, the complexity of getting in front of, of Rise Church here in Indianapolis and putting together a, a great time of worship. All right, well, we've got um, 30 percent 30 of our church is African American. Uh, we've got about forty five percent of our church is white. We've got a, uh, you know Latino. Sweetens. And then the demographics then are all over the place. We've got seventy year olds and we've got uh, fifteen year olds. And so, and so, boy, that, you're not going to make everybody happy with every song. And so what I think people need to learn to do is they need to learn to embrace the first language of other people and, and not be selfish <laughs> in their desire. And if we're never speaking their language, then maybe we need to adjust some of what we do. But again, we're not speaking everybody's language here because we're squeezing it through the Michael and Jessica filter. So we, we know what we're trying to do with our worship music and what we're trying to achieve. Now, that doesn't mean we won't do ancient hymns. We'll, we'll, we'll throw in an ancient hymn from time to time, but it's not going to be the, it's not going to be our staple. This, this question came up uh, when we were first doing this. We, we first started a band in Orlando and we were first introducing new music and new styles and things like that. And I had, uh, if I can just say it, a, a, a rich white couple come to me and say they thought we were ruining the church and all we were singing is, is contemporary music and gospel music. And they, that didn't really, they didn't really like that. And, and I challenged them. I said, well, you know, for, for 30 years, we have sung nothing but 500 year old music from white Europeans. And it seems to me that we're kind of overdue to branch out. And these other people, young people, uh, people from different ethnicities, et cetera, they've been willing to sing old white people music for their whole Christian life. Now, let's, why, isn't it time that we open up and begin to speak their first language of music and, and to, to speak to, to who we're trying to reach in our community 
you know, we don't do church just for you. We, we do church for a, a broad spectrum of people. And so that's, that's what we have to understand and embrace. Dave, I think uh, the conversations don't happen very often, um, but they're necessary. And yeah. uh, it, it, it's, it's trying, it's just, it's difficult sometimes when it seems so clear. Yeah, this is, this is yeah, if, if worship was about you uh, and we were worshiping you, then yeah, we'd play all your favorite music. But this is about worshiping God, and so it's a little different. Um, but amen. Uh, I appreciate your uh, guidance with that. Uh, P- Peter asked a question here in the chat. I, I think this is a great one. Uh, there you go. It's answered. The church leadership as a whole. Perfect. Yeah, the, the rebranding process, actually, the, the uh, initiative for the rebranding was actually brought about by one of our elders. He was the one who wanted us to do it. And then this, he'd been wanting this for, for a couple of years before I got here to Indianapolis. And so it, it came up in one of our elder evangelist meetings. And, and so then we formed a committee and we got some brainstorming. We redefined our core values. And then we, we figured out, you know, the whole rebranding process. And it was, it was very, very arduous. It, it took us 18 months to do. It was, it was a very busy, busy thing. Um, and so the, the leadership as a whole, elders, evangelists, staff, et cetera, we all bought in to the Michael and Jessica Lenz congregationally. We actually never really had this conversation with our worship team. We just, we, we just sort of took the Michael and Jessica Lenz into our worship planning and, uh, and we, we just started going that direction. And our worship team is very, very open, very malleable. They'll, they'll sing anything. They love it all. So we didn't really have, we, we haven't really had any, any conflict about that at all, except for the, you know, Daniela holds a lot of attitudes toward us in general, but aside from her, you know, we, we do pretty well. Um, totally understandable about her. And we can talk yeah. online maybe yeah. even further. Um, <laughs> I think that this uh, question that Peter dropped in the chat here is a great one to end on and is applicable to everybody on the call here. Uh, what are some of the main things that you focus on when you're training uh, a worship leader? What are some of the things you focus on training a worship leader with? Are you looking for characteristics or um, uh, like, Peter, do you want to clarify that any further? Sure. I was just curious. I know it's broad, but I don't know if there's some core things you re- you've focused on and the people you've helped train lead worship, whether it's their relationship with God, uh, how they lead worship practice, uh, their presence on stage, um, how you enhance or elevate the gifts they have in worship. Uh, whatever you focus on in training. That's a really great question. Um, and I can, I can answer it and I can also send some material to you. Um, I'll, let me answer it quickly. And then, uh, and then I can uh, do a quick edit of one of the documents that I've put together over the years. Um, the faithful worship leader, obviously there is a spiritual component. There is a talent component. Um, there is an energy component, a countenance component. There, there are a lot of elements. The, the thing that I work, and I, I think probably, uh, let's see, I'm looking over the list here, probably Daniela uh, would, would agree with this, that the thing I talk about most, and they get sick of me saying it, is that, is that people respond to this. They respond to your countenance and your energy level. And the most important thing a parts singer can do is to realize that they are a worship leader, whether they're, whether they're doing an acapella, you know, hand emotion or they're playing a guitar and singing the, the power of worshipers comes about through our body language. That's, that's how we communicate two thirds of what we communicate as worship leaders. And so certainly we, we need to be excellent. We need to, to do the very best we can do with the skill set that we have um, with the talents, the gifts that we've been blessed with, we have to have a sober estimate of what our gifts are and be willing to, to, you know, hand the leadership over to maybe people that are more gifted than we are. Um, it, all that stuff is very important. But so, so what I want to, I want our, our worship teams to be intentional. I want them to know what they're doing on stage, that they are taking the church and they're leading them to the presence of God. I want them to realize they do that through their countenance. And I say that 
Don't I, Daniela, over and over and over again um, uh, to the point where, I'm, in fact, I bet Josh and Michelle got tired of hearing me say that because I used to say it all the time in, in Chicago as well. Um, and then I, I also want to make sure that people are really doing the hard work of preparing themselves by knowing what the lyrics mean and singing with the spirit and the understanding. You know, people need to, they need to be aware of what they're saying to the church when they sing a song. They need to really embrace the lyrics because that's going to inform our countenance and our energy level. If we're singing the song, Oh, the Blood by Carrie Job, uh, and then we sing uh, Home in Heaven uh, by Brian Craig, then you know, we, we need to make sure that our countenance is appropriate, you know, that we're, we're going to look a different way when we sing, Oh, the blood or at the cross by Hillsong, we're going to look a different way than we do when we sing uh, a happy clappy song from our, our heritage, from, from our churches. And so, and so I, it's important. I think that people really intelligently approach the music um, very deliberately and intentionally to get those things right. Awesome. I, I have a book, um, not a book. I have a, a lesson that I taught. What is it called? It's called the faithful worship leader. And it, and it, I think I have seven or eight points there that sort of consolidate what I like to, to train my worship people in. So I'll, uh, Josh, I'll send that to you and you can group it out to the, to the group as well, as well as this. Uh, I'll send a PDF of our rise church worship list. So, and by the way, we, we, we try to do a lot of fun stuff too. Like we just did a version of, um, oh, what song was it? It was, uh, hallelujah. The, the, you know, Lord, we sing your praises loud. And and we, we pulled in uh, some of the old licks from Sultans of Swing by Mark Knopfler, uh, Dire Straits. So that's, you probably never heard of them. That's, that's one of my bands growing up. Um, and so, you know, we've done, uh, you know, I got a feeling by uh, who who did I got a feeling? Black Eyed Peas, I think. Black Eyed Peas, yeah. Um, we did I got a feeling, and we changed the lyrics to that. I've got a song we haven't done it yet. But well, I've got well, a Dave, re-write. we we did that in like 2005, so that was very relevant. It was very relevant in 2005. I've it would got, not be I've, relevant I've got, right now. <laughs> I've, got one, I've got one from Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple that we've done a number of places, which is fun, which that appeals to my generation. Um, not not relevant. You probably don't even know who Deep Purple is, but um, <clears throat> so um, so. But anyway, you can you can borrow from pop songs. It's very interesting, you know. When John Wesley uh, was writing all these hymns that we we all grew up with, that were 1600s, 1700s, he borrowed the tunes from barroom pop songs, and he took those tunes. And 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 by the way, he was he was excoriated. I mean, he got crucified by bringing barroom tunes into church settings in his generation. So the worship wars is not a, is not a new, a new thing. It's, it's been going on for hundreds of years. Um, but you know, so I think we can feel free to borrow people's songs and thoughts and things like that, you know, so be creative, Have have fun with it. And I'm sure that people were like, you're rowing in our church. We should have played the music from 100 years ago, you know, at that time. <laughs> uh, Dave, this has been, uh, I think, a great time. I know uh, I'm definitely going to look back over the recording. Um, for everybody else, I can make this recording available to you, uh, along with the materials that Dave has talked about um, on that Google form. And so it's in the chat, so just go ahead and click on that, and you can uh, – Type in your email, and I'll make sure that you get those resources. Dave, I Did want to thank. To me? Uh, I didn't yet, but I can share that with. You. Yeah, share that with me. I'll I'll provide my email address. So if you have any other specific questions, feel free to just shoot me a note to Dave at Rise Indiana So. And uh, the the forum there also, I, I put in a a place for a quick. Uh, you know, do you have any more questions for Dave? And so you can type that all in too. And I, Dave, I can make sure that gets forwarded to you, so you have it all in uh, one chunk. Um, thanks so much, Dave. I appreciate you a ton. I uh, figured we could we could close with a prayer here, and uh, you guys can all enjoy your Saturday afternoons. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll lead us. Let's let's go ahead and pray together. Uh, God, we're so grateful to come before you uh, on this Saturday afternoon to intentionally 
think about worship. Uh, think about our role that we play in helping others uh, just come to the foot of the cross and into your throne room, God, to worship you. Because you're certainly worthy of all of that adoration and praise. Uh, God, I, I pray that we would continue to learn how to acclaim you and to help others do the same. Uh, and that we would be mindful in our worship so that we can be evangelistically effective and that we can grow closer to you and learn more about your character, the way that you are, and uh, even become even more grounded in our conviction that you are worthy of all worship and praise. Uh, God, we love you. I pray that we would stay humble, that we would continue learning and uh, finding new ways uh, to connect with you and to bring other people into your presence. God, we love you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. And then we'll thanks everybody. Guys. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you.